101 and over the course of time one thing we like to do with fisheries topics is to share with the commission some of the tools and the processes that we use and as you saw in the previous presentation stocking regulations and habitat and access improvements are the big ones we use and uh, uh, Dave Lucchese is here this morning to share with us an <laughs> overview of stocking and evaluations and uh, Dave's got a lot of experience on this topic. He's been working on stocking evaluations since he got here back in 1988, I believe, and uh, he's got some very uh, good insight and he also is, is one of our go-to people for helping us evaluate our stocking programs. Dave? So before you do that, can I, can I just go back to the sure. Black Hills plan? Because I really do want to comment and thank you and Greg and Jake and the staff in Rapid City and the staff in Pier. There's a lot of interest in fishing in the Black Hills and a lot of very intense, passionate interest there. And you've accommodated that and listened and had extra meetings far beyond what was on the slide. And everybody does really appreciate it very much and I certainly do and I just want to thank you everybody for putting in the effort that I know you've put in. Um, thank you thank Commissioner you. Jensen and one other thing along that line is uh, we know we certainly realize it's going to be impossible to have everybody be completely satisfied with the plans. We have a very diverse uh, public and we we certainly have some resource uh, challenges out there that we have to address. The Black Hills may be the most focused on area in the state in terms of fisheries. It's also the most dynamic, especially when you start talking about the stream. So it's very important that we work closely with the public out there and our staff on a, a shared vision and approach to how we manage those resources. And this has been a, a very satisfying effort for me so far, this whole process of working with the public. And I think it's going to be a, a good example for the fisheries uh, program overall on a statewide level for how to engage the public. Seems like, just to, to follow up a little bit then, seems like maybe one of the issues that we'll have going forward is habitat improvement projects and how much they cost and, and where can we find the money for that sort of thing and it's a, it's a really good start and there'll be lots of issues to address after that. Uh, certainly, hopefully, we'll have some synergy going forward as a group and, and be able to keep the momentum up on addressing the habitat issues. Good job. With that, I'll ask Dave to take over and to share with you some of our strategies for how we uh, stock fish and how we evaluate those stockings. Good deal. All right. Hey, David. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, well, a couple of us put, uh, put together an article for the Conservation Digest last year on fish stocking in South Dakota, and subsequently uh, John asked us, or asked myself, to come to the uh, August Commission meeting and present on that. Well, the schedule filled up, and, uh, and so then he called me last week and said, hey, can you present here at uh, this Commission meeting, and maybe we'll have an associated meeting on strategic planning, and I said, sure. And this Monday rolled around, and I thought, oh, crap, I better find a place to stay. <laughs> and <laughs> so I, uh, I called the days in, and, uh, of course, they said they were full. They said not only did we have the legislative session, but there are several other events going on in Pierre, and so everything's full. But he recommended that uh, I check with the hitching horse in up there on Euclid. And so I did that, and... Uh, called up and he said, yeah, we were full, but we just had a cancellation, I can get you in, and he cut me a pretty good deal. And to put a plug in for his place, um, you know, the accommodations were uh, great, it's a neat old house, breakfast was really good, but the best thing was this morning as I was leaving, um, he said, hey, thanks for staying here, and oh, you might want to take that piece of toilet paper off your face <laughs> that you put there when you were shaving. And I said, thanks, that might have been brutal. <laughs> Uh -huh. So what I'd like to, this is going to be light and short, and um, what I'd like to talk to you about is, uh, is some of the thought process that goes into uh, where we decide to stock, when we decide to stock. Also, I'd like to talk about some of the different types of stocking we do, and then, as John mentioned, talk a little bit about some of the evaluation we do to assess whether or not we've been successful. 
Well, undoubtedly, fish stocking is one of our most popular, if not our most popular, management <clears throat> activities. And why is this? Well, the potential exists for, for almost immediate results. I mean, uh, we've actually unloaded fish off the truck, and a couple hours later, a day later, people are catching fish. So, so there are, there's an immediate uh, effect there. It's a tangible activity. I mean, it's pretty easy to wrap your arms around uh, the fact that if you put more fish into a lake, often you're going to have better fishing. You compare this to other things like biomanipulation or, or riparian habitat improvement, and, and I think it's, more, it's easier for people to grasp this activity. And finally, we're pretty good at producing, uh, providing fish. Uh, our hatcheries have, have streamlined their rearing techniques. Um, we, uh, we're pretty good at finding fish, trapping fish, transferring these fish, and, and it's something that our fish managers and our hatchery staff really like to do. So it's something we're pretty efficient at. But you know what? This popularity is a double-edged sword. Uh, kind of like with fishing regulations, minimum size limits, sometimes our anglers equate stocking with better fishing when it's not even working. I mean, it could be natural production that's producing these fish and stocking isn't doing anything and they may say, wow, look, stocking works really well. And some of you guys might recognize this joker on the right here. Um, that is Dick Sternberg. He was a big fishing promoter in Minnesota years back. And he felt like Minnesota, the DNR, wasn't stocking enough walleye over there. Their fishing wasn't good enough for walleye. And so he put together a coalition. That coalition pushed the legislature into uh, forcing the DNR to stock more walleyes. And so their, their accelerated stocking program was born. And sure, there may have been some benefits from it, but they also had to stock waters where they knew it wasn't working very well. We've been fortunate in this state, we haven't had that same kind of political push. However, it was interesting last year um, in one of our lake survey reports for Lake Mitchell, we stated that we felt stocking wasn't working based on our evaluation and that we thought we would discontinue stocking. Well, that ignited a Mr. Allen who, who basically contacted the newspaper and, and you know that created a small brush fire and um, and we weren't forced to stock, but, but we had to give it a little more consideration than we normally would have based on our results. And the funny thing is, is if I went to Mr. Allen and said, hey, I'll sell you 300 eater-sized walleyes for $6,000, he'd tell me I was whacked. And yet that's exactly what they're getting for their stocking dollar. So there are negatives associated with stocking. You know, sometimes one plus one doesn't equal two. I mean, if you stock fish and you stock on top of good natural production, you may actually produce too many fish. Those fish may have to compete for the resources out there, won't grow as well, and you may actually have higher mortality than you would have had you stocked nothing. So fewer fish out there. Stocking's expensive. It's expensive to maintain hatcheries. Um, producing fish is expensive, and if you're stocking them where they don't work, you're basically wasting license dollars. They've done, in eastern South Dakota, this isn't that big a problem. You know, we only have six lakes out there that haven't killed in the last uh, 100 years, so genetic issues aren't as big a problem, but on the west side of the state with trout, they've looked into some of the genetic impacts of stocking. And, uh, and, and there are problems with introducing different genetics into populations that are well adapted to the environments where they are living and reproducing. And finally, you know, species introductions can have negative consequences. Uh, the, the poster child is Baird's stocking of common carp to feed the immigrants uh, 150 years ago. But even, even stocking smallmouth, John, I mean, well, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think it's a bit overall been a positive, but we did not anticipate some of the controversy that it's generated in different areas. So just briefly, some of the principles uh, that, that we incorporate or use when we're stocking fish. First off, um, our fish are basically 
produced uh, in, in five different hatcheries around the state. We have our two state cool, cold water hatcheries, McNinney and Cleghorn over on the west side. Blue Dog is our warm water, cool water fish production facility. And then you have the two uh, federal hatcheries that, that contribute fish to our, our waters, uh, Gavin's Point and DC Booth. This is an old picture there, it's Al Knapp. But, um, but we also uh, reserve some of our waters. We, we don't allow fishing in them, and we use these waters to produce fish for stocking. Uh, we call them natural rearing ponds. And, and so we can take fish out of those natural rearing ponds and stock them into public waters. And finally, the third practice we use is trap and transfer from public waters. And, you know, the funny thing is, is, is when we interviewed interns in the, in the spring, often we'd ask a question, and the question would go something like this. An irate, or you're working out in the field, and an irate angler approaches you and complains that GF&P is taking water, or taking fish from your favorite lake, Lake A, and stocking them into Lake B. How do you respond to this angler? And, and I mean, we got a whole variety of, you know, like, GF&P would never do that. Uh, GF&P is perfect. GF&P, <laughs> you know, GF&P uh, knows what they're doing. There's too many fish in that lake, and, and they need to reduce the numbers and blah, blah, blah. When actually we wanted them to say, well, we don't know why they're doing it. Maybe, we should maybe you should ask your supervisor. But seriously, there are some considerations when you trap and transfer from public waters. And the, probably one of the biggest things is public perception. And we have to be careful from where we take these fish. The funny thing is, is, is uh, Region 3, Todd St. Sauver, they took a couple thousand crappies from Mitchell in the early 90s and 20 years later after they've had two or three bouts of good crappie fishing they still blame that event for destroying their crappie fishery and believe it or not those crappies are the ones that uh, their great 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 grandchildren are the ones that uh, those fish were stocked into Lake Thompson that produced the crappie fishery in Lake Thompson these last three or four years so it was their offspring so even though good came out of it, we, we took a lot of heat for it. One of the things that, that we try to do is we try to take fish from where they may not be catchable uh, to where they are catchable. And an example of this would be pike in Lake Preston or, or Whitewood. Um, they're really hard to catch. There's a lot of food in there. You take them, you put them into a lake like Interstate Lake in Brookings or Family Park Pond, and they bite, and anglers love them. So it, it works really well. Another thing, similar uh, aspect, might be taking fish where they're unpopular to where they're popular. Only a, a, you know, one or two percent of anglers on Lake Thompson might target pike, but you take those nice pike and you put them into an uh, into, uh, urban lake and they become very popular. They attract a lot of anglers. So I, these are 2013 numbers, but they'd be quite similar for 2014. Uh, our fish production in South Dakota, the biggest, uh, the biggest one is walleye production. We produce, you know, 40 to 50 million walleyes most years, uh, up to 2 million fingerlings, up to a million large fingerlings in our rearing ponds. Since 2008, our hatcheries have been producing uh, some yellow perch, uh, although on a much smaller scale. Rainbow trout, they just talked about that. They produce over 200,000 catchables. Uh, produce some brown trout. Those cold water hatcheries produce Chinook salmon for stocking into Oahe. And on a lesser scale, um, we rear some muskies that we get from Iowa and stock them into several lakes in eastern South Dakota. Channel catfish, we produce a few of those, smallmouth bass and largemouth bass. So what are the, a couple of the types of stockings that we do? Well, the first one is an introductory stocking. And, and just like it sounds, we're putting fish, we're introducing fish into a water. It might be a newly created water like uh, Lake Henry down in Bonhomme County. Uh, it might be a lake that winter killed or a renovated lake where we did Rotenone <coughs> like, uh, like the Black Hills guys just mentioned. But we're introducing those fish where they previously did not exist or they've been extirpated. And this one's often a slam dunk. You don't have predation, you don't have competition, 
and, and so and so it can be it can be very effective and often with a high probability. Some examples: um, those rearing ponds will take pre-spawn panfish out of there, like these yellow perch. You put them in. Not only do you get those fish in there, but they reproduce well, and you get their offspring, and it works extremely well. We're, we're, hatcheries are very capable of producing walleye fry or fingerlings. We'll stock winter kill or new waters with those. And then other examples of introductory stockings, when they first put Chinook salmon into the reservoirs, our musky stockings into some of our eastern South Dakota lakes, when we first put smallmouth bass in, uh, channel catfish, so introducing a new species. And finally, sometimes we'll stock forage fish. If there's not enough food in the lake, fish aren't growing that well, we may put, say, gizzard shad uh, into a small impoundment or ciscos into a reservoir. Um, maintenance type stockings. These are, are stockings into water where there, the fish are already in there, but there might not be a lot of natural reproduction. And, and examples of this might be, you know, we introduce species like salmon, muskies, and gizzard shad but they don't reproduce well or they don't reproduce at all in those waters, and so we have to maintain those populations. And finally, the last type of stocking is supplemental. And, and here we're stocking into waters that might have sporadic recruitment, might go three, four years without a lot of young being produced, or the recruitment's consistent, but it's not very good, it's low. However, we need to put a little bit more consideration into these stockings because you are stocking on top of fish that are already there and potentially good natural production. So what we try to do is we try to go into these lakes or streams. We identify using our, our survey methods. This is one of the things we use our survey methods for, whether there's been good natural production and whether there's already a, a good adult population in there. And if there isn't, then we might decide to stock, and it's sort of stocking into a void of fish. One of the things we do is we mark uh, these stocked fish at times so that we can distinguish them from naturally produced fish, and that helps us evaluate our stockings. And types of marking could include fin clipping, coated wire tagging, implant tags, or oxytetracycline marking. Now, Jake already alluded to this. They did that evaluation on, uh, on trout stocking on Rapid Creek, and they radio tagged those fish. And, and most of you are probably aware of the results already, but uh, I guess the mink decided they weren't going to follow harvest restrictions and, <laughs> and uh, accounted for 30% of the fish mortality there. Jesus, that's high. That seems like really high. Amazing. <laughs> um, on the east side, of, well, actually across the state, we've, we've used oxytetracycline to mark our, our stocked uh, uh, fry and fingerling walleyes and yellow perch. And um, the, initially what we did way, way back in the day, this is when Doug Hansen was a biologist, was he looked at patterns of fish produced during stocked years versus unstocked years. Unfortunately, there's a lot of variation in natural production and survival of stocked fish, so that was difficult. Well, then we decided to start marking our fish with oxytetracycline, which helped. And if you look at these results, this was a study that I worked on back in the late 90s. You know, you, walleye fry and four lakes that we stocked them accounted for 93% of the production. And fingerlings accounted for 87% of the production. And you look at this and you say, wow, if we don't stock, we're not going to have any walleyes out there. But that's not true with all lakes. If you look at our best fishery, walleye fishery in Region 3, it's mostly naturally produced fish. So, so Mother Nature is capable of producing really good walleye fishing. Here we have Lake Madison, and the, the light blue bars are, are stocked fish. The dark blue bars are naturally produced fish. In Lake Madison, you can see that stocking is very important, but if we go to East Vermilion Lake, it's all dark blue. You're wasting your time if you stock fish on top of the naturally produced fish. So these are a couple of the things that we've learned about stocking through the years. One of the other things, uh, uh, recently a grad student, Jeff Gross at, Grote at SDSU, he looked at, at stocking rates, and how many fish we stocked, and he compared it to the number of age two fish out there that were produced. 
And um, he found that our stocking densities might have actually been a little high, that there were actually more produ fish produced at a lower stocking rate than, than what we were currently using. And that this might have, a, you know, if we went to those reduced stocking rates, we would still get the same bang for the buck, but might save money. And he calculated about $38,000 in the two regions there. So this is uh, another way that we, we try to streamline or make our stocking efforts more efficient. Now, more recently, um, we started stocking yellow perch. And this is experimental at this point in time. Um, but we did mark those perch. We were able to successfully mark them with oxytetracycline. Uh, what we had found um, up until last spring was that they didn't go, just go out and die. There, there were perch produced in our lakes, but it was, production was generally low, uh, less than we had hoped for. And then we concluded that fingerling stocking may improve in abundance in some small waters, um, but that bigger waters, we didn't think it would work. Well, our Todd St. Solver decided to put all of this year's perch production into Brant Lake, which has been kind of a void for perch this year, and boom. Those perch, those perch took really well. In fact, our fall netting seining this year, uh, it produced a heck of a year class. 93% of those fish had marks. <laughs> uh, they were stocked. So hope, it, you know, the potential exists now for people to say, well, hey, look, this worked here. Why aren't you stocking our lake with perch? And yet we have to remember that often this doesn't work. So there's, it's still out there for evaluation, but but uh, this, this could put a little pressure for, uh, on us to uh, expand some perch stockings. Now, one perch stocking that has really worked out well at times is adult perch stocking. And uh, as you can see, this is about as good a return as you're gonna get off a of stocking. We stocked about 3,500 uh, perch into Scott Lake just north of Hartford there. And not only did it generate a good fall fishery, which we didn't assess, but we put a krill survey on the winter fishery and we found it got about 4,000 hours of angler use, people targeting perch. So that was extremely successful. We'd also like to uh, expand our use of, uh, of uh, channel catfish and, and largemouth bass stockings. We have that heat pump that I think is functioning now and that will allow us to uh, overwinter these fish and, uh, and stock them in the spring. And we know that spring stocked fish have a greater chance of survival than our lakes, late summer stocked fingerlings. So in summary, although it's not always successful, stocking is an important tool that we use to manage and improve the quality of our fisheries. Um, it is important for us to continue to evaluate this, to refine our rearing techniques, and to refine our stocking strategy so that we better use our hatchery reared and trap and transferred fish. And finally, I think we must, you know, openly communicate with the public about our stocking strategies, our successes and our failures so they have a relatively accurate picture of what's going on. And with that, I'll take any questions. Questions for Dave. I have one. You mentioned um, stocking on Madison. Do you guys do any on Herman? Yeah, we do stock uh, Lake Herman. Um, and Lake Herman is one of the, the lakes, I, I was actually going to initially mention this, but um, there was an unauthorized introduction of white bass into Herman. All of a sudden they showed up. And since those white bass have been introduced, our uh, stocked walleyes went from being about six inches in the fall to about four inches in the fall because they're competing with all these young white bass. And, and since then, our, their survival through the first year has, has decreased. And so we, we're not seeing as good a take on our, our stocking there as we did previous. Thanks. Good job, Dave. Thanks. Way to go. Secretary, for a second, just a point of information. Go ahead. Our 2014 stocking report is now on our website. So for the commissioners, if you have a certain lake you're interested on, you can certainly go into the uh, to the Game and Fish website under the fishing, tools for fishing, and uh, take a look at what's been stocked in 2014. 
Yeah, that's a that's a great move. I know a lot of people, of course, that uh, that are up on that. They always ask about those kinds of things, and now it's it's available to them. So I think it's a it's a great public relations move. <coughs> John, we're going to take just a 10-minute break so that we can stretch our legs, and then we'll come back and we'll uh, talk on Lake Oahe. Okay? Ten minutes, folks, and then we'll be